What gets you angry? What um, winds you up? Uh, it depends, I suppose, on the kind of person you are. But these are the kind of days when we can get uh, wound up about all sorts of things. We can get wound up about statues, for instance. Who never thought that historical statues would be something that we get very cross about? Of course, what matters is what lies behind them. And the fact that if we're honest, uh, statues celebrate the person that they are a statue of. You have to have done something noteworthy, something good in the eyes of, of people uh, to get yourself a statue. Um, I'm not holding out for one. I don't think there'll ever be one of me. But we also pontificate and we get angry about things that in some ways we know nothing about. We get angry about stuff that um, has nothing to do with us. We get angry about things that in the long run don't really seem to matter that much. Perhaps we tell ourselves that we have righteous anger, that it's right that we get angry about this or angry about that. I'm actually quite a fan of, of Churchill. I don't think anyone's serious about removing his statue. But if he were alive, I think he'd be more upset still about the fact that he, he lost a 1945 election at the end of the Second War, World War than he would ever be about somebody throwing some paint on his statue. James has a lot to say about anger. And uh, he's a lot to say to us if we think we have righteous anger. Um, because, well, let's, we've had it read to us. Let's see what he says. And we can break the, the passage that was read to us into three um, sections, really. He says, first of all, that we should listen. He then tells us to look to look at ourselves and to examine ourselves. And then he tells us about the way we need to live. Don't often alliterate my sermon points, but today I did. Listen, look, and live. Not that long ago, in fact it was last summer, though it seems an eon away, uh, I went with a couple of the boy, my boys, one, one son and one stepson, to Berlin. We'd been before and, and love it. And uh, one of them hadn't been and, and wanted to see what was going on. It was exhausting. Uh, they're a lot quicker at walking than I am. Um, there was lots to see and lots to do. And we didn't get to see or do half the things that uh, they wanted to do. But we visited Checkpoint Charlie, and at Checkpoint Charlie, it was the, the point where East and West Berlin met, and the Americans were in charge of that particular checkpoint. It, it was famous. It's famous for all sorts of reasons, but uh, one of them being that for a while, back in the middle of the Cold War, um, the American tanks and the Russian tanks actually faced each other, and there was the thought that war might begin. So it's a place with a lot of historical significance. And there we were, as we were walking around, and, and you, we could hear as we approached um, someone talking very loudly. In fact, he was shouting. And it turned out to be, well, I guess an Italian man, because it sounded like he was speaking in Italian. Well, he wasn't so much speaking as telling the whole world something. Didn't understand a word of it. But he shouted at the top of his voice, and he kept on going. He was angry about something. But because he was speaking in Italian, I certainly had no clue what he was talking about. And I would guess most of the people who were there knew, knew nothing about what he was talking about. And basically avoided him. I hope he got it out of his system. But it was a bit embarrassing, really. And yet, you know, I've come to the conclusion that... All of us do something a bit like that from time to time. For some of us, in fact, we do something like that daily. Oh, we don't do it with our voice. We don't go and stand in Shubri High Street or down on the beach and shout, perhaps in Italian or another language, about something. But what we do do is we use these or perhaps these. And we give our opinions 
on things from the completely innocuous to the downright dangerous. We have opinions on what people say. We have on people's opinions on what people do. We have opinions on what people think. Sometimes we just like something. Sometimes we write um, in response to something that someone has said. And the more we see, and the more we do, and the more we write, sometimes the more angry we get. At least that's the way it seems to me when I read um, some of the stuff I see on Facebook. Yes, even some of your stuff. We'll come back to that. But as James talks about us being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, we need, first of all, to concentrate on this quick to listen and slow to speak. How many times do we check out what people are actually saying to us? How many times do we go off on one because we haven't quite understood what they've said or we haven't quite heard what they've said? Or because we happen to have a very strong opinion on that, though we've only heard of it 30 seconds ago, and uh, we need to get our say in. We need to change their mind. We need to put them right. Well, James says we should be quick to listen and slow to speak. And today, if James was writing for today, I would say that he would say, slow to reply to what we see on social media, slow to pass on what we see and agree with without checking who it is that's saying it and what else they've said, who we're agreeing with, who we are saying we are one with. Quick to listen, really listen, really understand. Someone has said, in the light of the nature of temptation and the goodness of God, we must take special care to be slow to wrath because our wrath doesn't accomplish the righteousness of God. Our wrath is almost always simply defending or promoting our own agenda. Quick to listen. slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I despair sometimes at the anger I see on social media, about the arguments that start over what seems like nothing, but suddenly becomes the most important thing in all the world when someone says something against it. Slow to speak and slow to become angry. Why? Because human anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires. Straightforward, simple fact. You might think it's okay to get outraged about this and about that, and someone should do something about it. James says, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Your anger does not produce the righteousness that God wants. So stop it. And He's given us a practical way to stop it. Don't get involved in things that are nothing to do with you, that you cannot change, that you can do nothing about, that you feel that you have to put your opinion up there like that Italian man shouting at Checkpoint Charlie for all the world to see. Well, you don't, and neither do I. Sometimes it's okay to keep our opinions to ourselves and not get involved. Just get on with the life that God has called us to. Because we will get angry, and that anger will not lead to righteousness. So stop it.
to begin with. Therefore, he says, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. And we think, oh yes, we need to do something about the morality of this country. We need to do something about the evil that is so prevalent. He's talking about what's in our hearts and in our minds. He's not talking about the world out there. He's talking about what's going on in here and in here. He says, get rid of it. One of the words used um, here, and for the, the one for the, that's translated filth in the NIV, is a word that, that talks about stuff that builds up, about dirt that builds up, and it, it's, it's very, very close to the word that they use for, for earwax. And the thought is that as it, as it builds up and as it builds up gradually, not only does, do things get dirty, but gradually you can lose your hearing. You'll know someone. Um, I know a few who have had problems with their ears because their wax gradually builds up and they can't hear. And he, I don't think it's any accident that he uses this word as he talks about what we need to get rid of. We need to get rid of the things that fill our minds and that fill our hearts that are nothing to do with the righteousness of God, that are nothing to do with His work and His way. Now listen to this carefully. Listen, be slow to speak. I don't think God really cares whether the statue of Winston Churchill stays or goes. I don't think He does. I do. I think it should still be there. But I don't think He does. And I'm not going to get angry about it, because that anger will not lead to righteousness. And as I allow all sorts of different causes about statues or whatever else. I'm not talking now about bigger causes, causes to do with injustice towards people, because people are who God loves, not things. We need to get out in our heads. But as our love for things and attitudes and nostalgia builds up in our lives, it takes us away it builds up and it makes us deaf. It stops us listening to other people and it stops us listening to God. Humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Oh, deliver me from my opinions. I'll tell you what. I don't think God takes a lot of notice of my opinions. He would rather that I followed His. His ways his attitudes, his words, his thoughts. He is not bound to mine, but I need to be bound to his. Humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. John, James doesn't tell us just to stop sinning and be better people. He tells us to stop sinning and accept or keep accepting or accept on a deeper level the message of Christ with humility. It is Christ's goodness in us that counts, not our own efforts to be good, not saying this or saying that or putting people right on their wrong attitudes or their wrong opinions. It is Christ's goodness in us that makes us the people that God wants us to be and brings us to do the things that God wants us to do with humility. As Spurgeon says, the first thing then is receive. Accept, receive. The word receive is very instructive, a gospel word. It is the door through which God's grace enters into us. We are not saved by working, but by receiving, not by what we give to God, but by what God gives to us, and we receive from Him. The Word of God, the Word planted in us, the very power of God Himself. Don't let it get pushed out by all the petty squabbles and arguments that we can get involved in in real life or on social media. It's okay not to reply. It's okay not to speak. In fact, James tells us to be slow to speak. It's time we learned that lesson. He then says, look, don't merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Then he explains it. Oh, we're very good at listening, but we're never, not very good at understanding. We love to, 
to see all the intricate bits of, of the Scriptures. We love to, to understand all the little bits and pieces. We love to, to hear a sermon that, that, that lifts us and, and explains and makes us feel good. But what about doing it? I remember once when I was, I was chaplain uh, to the Air Training Corps in Linton. I was at a, a camp for lots of um, cadets, and uh, everyone was taking selfies with everyone else. And I find selfies quite annoying, to be honest. Um, but you know, when I was preparing a talk I was going to do for them on the parade ground, I started it off um, with the phrase, I think God loves selfies. Now, that caused quite a stir. But I was preaching on, I was speaking on this verse, these verses. Because here, God tells us through James, to, to look at ourselves in a mirror, the mirror of the Word of God. And instead of having, looking at it for a quick glance, it's as if God's saying, take a picture of that, that you can take with you and you can keep looking at, keep looking intently into, see yourself in the light of the Word of God. Now, one of the reasons I don't particularly like selfies is I don't like the result when I take them. Um, and I don't particularly like doing this. Well, actually, I don't, I don't mind doing this. Um, you can't be rude to me um, when I'm preaching, can you? But, um, or if you are, it's, it's afterwards when it's recorded and I don't see it. But I hate watching myself on the screen or listening to myself because it is who I am. I think I don't have an accent, but when I listen, I think, oh, perhaps I have. Um, but God says, keep looking at yourself in the light of the Word of God. Not in the light of other people, not, in, not comparing yourself to others, but comparing ourselves to the standards that God sets. Not comparing others to the standards that God sets, comparing ourselves to the standards that God sets. So, we need to listen. Listen to the Word of God of God, and see ourselves as God sees us. You know, if you've listened to me before, that I'm a great fan of John Newton, um, that man who was a slave trader and, and found God in a storm and spent the rest of his life um, trying to set people free from sin as he preached the good news about Jesus, but also trying to set people free from slavery. Um, that, that curse um, and that shame on our nation uh, that we were involved with that. And despite what we tell ourselves, we weren't the first to get rid of it. We, were, we did okay, but not well. But he, he, he fought sometimes against church authorities, sometimes against members of parliament who made lots of money out of owning slaves. When he went to Oni, one of the verses that he put on his wall of his study that he could see as he prepared his sermons and as he wrote the hymns he wrote. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman, bondsman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Deuteronomy 15, 15. He never forgot what he'd been, and neither should you, and neither should I. We need to look at ourselves in the light of the Word of God. Remember that we are no better than anyone else, that our opinions matter no more just because we belong to Christ. What matters is what He has done for us, and what matters is that we remember what we were, and in truth still are, sinners, fallen away from God, rescued only by the grace and the goodness of God Himself. There's a story told of, uh, it's not true, obviously, it's just a story told of, of uh, some people coming out of a church in Scotland, and Donald comes out of Kirk, a um, bit sooner than usual, and Sandy, his friend who, who was outside, said, uh, what, Donald, is the sermon all done? No, said Donald, it's all said, but it's not begun to be done yet. God calls us to listen and to do. But we don't, do we? 
Oh, we glance at God's Word, and we see it, and we see the bits we like, and maybe we gloss over the bits we don't like, and we think, that's great. I wish so-and-so had heard that. I wish so-and-so would do that. No, God says, what about you? What about me? Spurgeon, that famous Baptist preacher, preached to great numbers, the sort of numbers that uh, all our preachers could only be jealous of, thousands at a time. And he wrote this, I fear we have many in all congregations of admiring hearers, affectionate hearers, attached hearers, but all the while unblessed hearers, because they are not doers of the Word. Listen and do what? Well, we're about to come on to some of it, but we need to go back to the first point. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Slow to speak. It's time to do it. How many people have I seen over the years fall out because something said on Facebook? And then, then it all begins. And it's all done as if you were shouting it to the whole world for the whole world to say, just stop. I don't care. And more importantly, God doesn't care what they've said to you and what they've done to you. Stop. Listen. Don't get angry. Because it's not what God wants. It's not good for His glory. And it's not good for your soul. So stop. Listen to what the Word says and do it. So what is the doing? Well, in verse 26, um, he tells us, those who consider themselves religious and don't keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. Don't keep a tight rein on their tongues. He's back to it again, and he'll be back to it next week as well. Keep a rein on your tongue. Watch what you say. Oh, no, but that needs said. No, it doesn't need said. It needs not to be said, in fact. I truly don't understand why some of the things that get passed on in fa on Facebook, for instance, get passed on. People like and share things. And I think, hmm. And then I look at who's actually written it, the organization behind it, and the vile um, words that are on their Facebook page. And we have people that I consider friends passing it on. What I don't do is probably come back at them because I've had to learn to listen and try to understand what's going on and perhaps not speak. And it's a wonderful thing on Facebook you could do. Uh, you can snooze someone for 30 days and they don't even know that you're not seeing the stuff that they're sharing. It's amazing. And you don't know who you are, do you? If you don't like what you see, stop looking. Look into God's Word and His ways instead. But keep control of your tongue. If you think you're religious, if you think you are following God's ways and doing God's things, but you speak words that hurt people, that cut people off, that make people feel this high, then that religion is worthless and pointless. You might obey all the rules you like, but if you can't keep your tongue civil in your mouth, if you can't top, stop yourself saying things to people that hurt them, or saying things about people that hurt them, or say things, saying things like, oh, well, you know about him. Well, he did this and that, and that's why he's like this. And, and we know nothing about what we're saying. We don't understand half of the situation. It's frustrating sometimes, but I'll let you into a secret. As a minister, I have people, parishioners, if you like, people who are part of a church, and it's happened here, and it's happened, I think, in every church that I've been in, who sidle up to me and say, isn't it terrible what's happening with so-and-so? And of course, um, I know more about it than they do because I've spent time with people. And isn't it terrible what so-and-so is doing to them? And I think to myself, if you knew what they were doing to them, you'd be even more shocked. 
but I won't say it and I certainly won't tell it. We rattle off about things that we know nothing about. It's time to stop. It's time to stop talking about other people. It's time to stop sometimes even doing it in the, in the guise of sharing concern. There are times I want to go la, la, la in my head when people tell me something about someone that tears them down and destroys them. And actually is beginning, would begin to stop me doing the work that God would want me to do with them. And I think to myself, why are you telling me this? Is it out of real concern, or is it because you want me to know that you know? In Proverbs, we had read to us by, by Ruth, um, in verse 27, we read this, 28, the one who has knowledge uses words with restraint, and whoever has understanding is even-tempered. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. Even if you are what we would have called back home an Egypt, you can allow people to think you're wise by just shutting up. And it's amazing. It's amazing how we can get involved in people's lives and be of help when, we, when they know that we will not divulge what they tell us, when they trust us with their deepest, darkest fears and worries. And how do they know that we won't divulge it? Because we don't divulge things about other people to them. If you go around talking about people, if you go around, oh, it's terrible about this and it's terrible about that, you know what? No one will trust you with the things that really matter to them because they know that you will pass it on. Keep a tight rein, not just about anger, but about everything. In Proverbs, in verse 19, that was read to us, we read, whoever loves a quarrel loves sin. Some people just love to argue, love to quarrel love to start a fight, love to start a quarrel, love to see, to, to, it's almost like throwing in a grenade into the water and standing back to watch the ripples. Well, Proverbs tells us, if you love doing that, you love to sin, and it's time to stop it. It's time to use this tongue sparingly and for the goodness and the greatness of God. He says, anyone, anyone who doesn't have a rein on their tongue is deceiving themselves as they think that they're showing the goodness of God. But he also says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Someone again has said, true religion does not merely give something for the relief of the distress, but it visits them. That's what the Greek word means. It takes the oversight of them. It takes them under its care. It goes to their houses and speaks to their hearts. It relieves their wants, sympathizes with them in their distresses, instructs them in divine things, and recommends them to God. And all this it does for the Lord's sake. This is the religion of Christ. How often too often, I believe. People have been put off church because it's a church where everyone talks about everyone else behind their back. It happens everywhere, but it shouldn't. No wonder they say, well, if that's what Christianity is all about, I don't want to be part of it, because if that's what Christianity is all about, neither do I. But it isn't what Christianity is about. Christianity is about following Christ and about following His ways. It's about looking into His Word and allowing it to be a mirror that mirrors back who we are and what we are in Him. It involves keeping our tongues quiet and in control. It involves looking after the helpless and the hopeless, in spite of whether they got themselves into it or not. And who knows if they did? Well, God alone knows. Who are you to judge? Who am I to judge? If someone needs help, if someone is in distress, then we should be helping them. Full stop. Forget about anything else. 
but also keeps ourselves from being polluted by the world. How does the world pollute us? It pollutes us in this case, I believe, is what he's talking about. It pollutes us by giving us attitudes and thoughts that are displeasing to God, and it causes us to run our mouths off about people and about situations and about things that we basically know nothing about, but we have to have an opinion, don't we? Which brings dishonor on the name of Christ. So listen. Next time you want to correct someone, stop. Listen. When it all gets too much for you and you just have to say something, listen. Be slow to speak. Slow, slow to speak. Look. Don't look at others, but look into the the mirror that is the Word of God. Compare yourself with the standard that is set there, and not in the passages where you find it easy and where you'd never do that sort of thing, but but what about the passages that that you find hard? Read them again and again, and perhaps this, this, this has been one of them. And control the tongue, oh, yeah, and the fingers on social media. Stop your shouting to the world. Because we tell ourselves the lie. Oh, well, we've got to put it right. We're not going to put it right with our words. But what we are going to do is wind up the situation and bring dishonor upon God's church and upon God's name. Religion that is pure and righteous is about looking after those in need and keeping ourselves free from the things that would ensnare us. And in this situation, it's taking on the attitudes of the world around us. Maybe because of the political party we follow. Maybe because of the way we've been brought up, perhaps the part of society we're in. Perhaps because of the color of our skin and of our experience. We say things that are hurtful and damaging to our brothers and sisters who are of another race or another culture. It's time to shut up, to listen to others and to listen to God and allow Him and His Word to transform our lives. Will you come on the journey with me? Or will you rather get involved in a quiet